Good morning. My name is the Reverend Dr. Marcel Bush, and I'm the senior pastor of the Majority Baptist Church here in Spartanburg, South Carolina. I hope that you and your family are doing well and that you are all safe. And I want to thank you for choosing to tune in to this week's edition of Majority Baptist Church here on YouTube TV. First of all, before I get into today's message, I do want to spend just a few minutes sharing with us some very important announcements and acknowledgements. I do want to ask, number one, that we continue to keep Sister Jackie Wilkins and family in our thoughts and in our prayers. We learned on this week that Sister Wilkins lost her cousin, and truly we want the family to know and Sister Wilkins to know that we love you and that we are keeping you lifted in prayer and we are praying for your strength and comfort as you walk through this season of bereavement. Also, on another note, I do want to thank everyone who tuned in to our town hall meeting for voter education on this past week. We had a successful virtual town hall and our special guest was uh, Congressman Jim Clyburn as well as Senate candidate Jamie Harrison, along with several other special guests, including our very own uh, state representative, uh, Sister Henderson Myers, uh, Rosalind Henderson Myers, excuse me, who also participated with others in that town hall. And brothers, sisters, friends, we could not have asked for a better um, experience and it is due to you. And we thank you so much for your support and for tuning in to that very, very special time that we had on this past week. I do want to encourage us, let us remember that this is the voting season and early voting has begun. And I want to encourage everybody to please make sure, number one, that you're registered to vote. And then number two, it's important, it's imperative that you get out and vote you can begin voting. Uh, again, voting has begun and you can vote in person early this year. And because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, anybody can go and vote early in person. And in Spartanburg, you can go to the Spartanburg Memorial Auditorium between the hours of 8.30 a.m. to 5 o'clock p.m. And that is Monday through Friday. You can also make sure that you mark the date down. The early voting will take place through November the 2nd. So please, please make sure that you get out and vote early if you can. If you're voting by mail in South Carolina, understand that you may need to make sure that you have someone to witness your ballot. Someone does need to sign as a witness on your ballot. The Supreme Court uh, overturned the earlier decision. So we're having to make sure that we get the word out. If you're voting by mail, make sure that you have someone to witness your ballot to sign. And, and, and that is very, very important. And if you're mailing your ballot in, please don't sit on your ballot as we've been saying for a number of weeks now. Make sure you fill that ballot out carefully and then get it right back in the mail or if you're able, if you want to drop it off at your voter of elections office, please do that and do it right now because we wanna make sure again that we get our ballots in, get our votes in early this year. At the very least, if you're not doing either one of those on November the 3rd, don't let the sun set on November the 3rd without you going to your polling place and exercising your right to vote. Brothers and sisters, I cannot tell you and stress uh, how important this election is. I want you to know that healthcare is on the ballot, Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid is on the ballot, the environment is on the ballot, social justice is on the ballot. So we cannot afford to play around. This election is serious. And I've been saying this now all week long, we must vote like our lives depend on it. It's important. Go and vote for the candidate of your choice. And um, I want to thank you so very much. If you uh, know of persons who are not registered, 
help them to get registered. You can go to vote.org. If you're not registered, go to vote.org register to vote. It only takes a couple of minutes to register. And then once again, once you're, once you're registered, make sure you go and vote. It is important. Let me also stress that we are still in the midst of a pandemic. Um, we need to make sure when we go out, please wear a mask. Mask saves lives. That is crucial. Make sure, brothers and sisters, that you're washing your hands and never touch your face without washing your hands. And that is very, very, very important. Let us practice social distancing and make sure that at least there's six feet between you and the other person. So again, these things are important. And don't let anybody fool you. We're only halfway, according to medical experts, we're only about halfway through this pandemic. We're getting ready to hit the cold and flu uh, season. And if you have not gotten your flu shot, please make sure that you get that immediately. Make sure that everyone in your household has gotten the flu shot and, and also encourage friends, family members, coworkers, neighbors to get their flu shot because we are afraid that because of the pandemic in conjunction with cold and flu season, this could overwhelm hospitals. So let us do again everything we can to be proactive and try to stave off not getting sick by doing these uh, uh, common sense things like wearing a mask and also getting a flu shot. Those things are important. Brothers, sisters, friends, we love you. We care about you. We want you to make sure that you stay healthy and uh, we know that with God's help, God has not left us. God is going to bring us through this. So God bless you. And thank you so much for indulging me as we uh, make those announcements. Brothers and sisters, we're now going to turn to our text this morning, which is found in the book of 2 Kings, chapter number 20. And we'll be lifting up verses 1 through 7. Again, that's 2 Kings chapter 20, verses 1 through 7. And I'll be reading from the New International Version of the Bible. And the word reads, In those days, Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to him and said, This is what the Lord says, Put your house in order, because you are going to die you will not recover. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord, remember, O Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Before Isaiah had left the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him, go back and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, this is what the Lord says. The God of your father, David, says, I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will heal you. On the third day from now, you will go up to the temple of the Lord. I will add 15 years to your life, and I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend the city for my sake and for the sake of my servant, David. Then Isaiah said, Prepare a poultice of figs. They did so and applied it to the boil, and he recovered. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his righteous and holy word. And for just a few moments this morning, brothers and sisters, I would like to speak to you on this subject, the power of prayer. The power of prayer. May we bow our heads for a word of prayer. Merciful God, Father, we come again at this hour to say thank you. We thank you, God, for this privilege to study your word one more time. Father, we thank you for those who are listening to this message. We ask, God, that you would bless their hearts, their minds, and we declare them good soul and ground where your word can be planted. And we ask, God, that least of all, you would bless this, your servant. Give me the words, God, to give to your people. And Father, through the Holy Spirit, 
we pray that you will bless us all. It is in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, that we pray, amen. The power of prayer. First of all, sisters and brothers, when we begin to examine this 20th chapter of 2 Kings, we quickly discover that there are two key people in this text, which is the prophet Isaiah and the king of Judah known as Hezekiah. And right from the beginning, we are given some very disturbing and troubling news about Hezekiah. When we look at verse one, the word informs us that right after the deliverance of Jerusalem from the Assyrian empire, King Hezekiah became extremely sick and was at the point of death. However, right before Hezekiah's death, the Lord sent the prophet Isaiah to the king with a message that he was to put his affairs in order because he was soon going to die. Now let me stick a pen right here for a moment because this verse is a very good reminder this morning that none of us are going to live forever. And each one of us has the responsibility to make sure that we prepare for the day when we will pass away by setting our affairs in order. As a pastor, I must be honest and tell you this morning that there's nothing more heartbreaking than when a family has to scramble both psychologically and financially after another member of the family passes on. Here the prophet is telling the king to get his house in order. And that's what all of us must do by making sure that we are being good caretakers of the resources that God has placed in our possessions because none of us again are going to live forever. And our goal must be to leave our children as well as future generations in a better position than we had found ourselves. However, if we look back at the text, after getting this horrific news from the prophet, look at how the king responds to this information. We're told that Hezekiah immediately turns his face to the wall and began to cry out. And in verse three, the king begins to remind the Lord about three important facts. First, he reminds God that he had been faithful in following God. Secondly, he reminds God that he had been loyal and totally devoted to him. And third and finally, Hezekiah reminds God that he had behaved righteously before God. Then to end his prayer, Hezekiah begins to weep bitterly, the text says, which shows that his heart was broken and that he was submitting his life to the Lord's will. After Hezekiah pours out his heart to God, we are told that the Lord immediately answers the king's prayers. But watch this. Obviously, Isaiah had already left the room of Hezekiah and was heading back home. However, before Isaiah could leave the courtyard of the palace, God instructed Isaiah to return immediately to Hezekiah with a second message, letting the king know that the Lord had heard his prayer. And as a result, he was going to heal Hezekiah. In verse five, the Lord instructs Hezekiah that on the third day, he is going into the temple and he must worship the Lord. In verse six, God went on to inform the king that he was going to add 15 good years to the king's life. And he was going to deliver both him and Jerusalem from their enemy, the Assyrians. To end the text, in verse seven, Isaiah instructs the king's service to servants to prepare an ointment of fig leaves and place it on the king's body. And as a result, the king recovered just as God had promised. This text this morning offers for you and I, brothers and sisters, three good pieces of advice that we must follow. And I'm convinced if we follow this model executed by Hezekiah, then our prayers will be more effective and we will see an even greater movement of God in our lives, especially in times of trouble and adversity. The first point that I must make here is that in times of trouble and chaos, we must always remember, first of all, to pray. 
Notice again that the first thing that King Hezekiah does once he receives this devastating news from Isaiah is that, that he's going to die and that he must set his affairs in order. The first thing that he does is that he turns his face to the wall and he begins to pray to the Lord. Hezekiah was getting himself, in other words, in a position where he could be alone with God. And I like this, brothers and sisters, and this is what we have to remember. You and I, when we face challenges and hurdles in our lives, when our backs are up against the wall, you and I must always remember, first and foremost, the first order of business is to bow our heads in prayer. That is, you and I must learn how to get alone with God. We must get ourselves into a quiet place where we can totally focus on God and hear the voice of God in our hearts. In fact, you and I must learn how to pray even before trouble ever comes to us. That's what we call having a daily prayer life. Every day we must pray to God for his countenance and direction. We must pray for God's protection. And we should also pray for God to bless and protect other people. When trouble came, evidently Hezekiah did not have to reintroduce himself to God. He already knew God on a personal level. So when trouble presented itself, he could confidently cry out and tell God in a very transparent way what he wanted and what he needed. And the same thing must be true about us this morning when trouble comes into our lives. If we know God on a personal level, we can go to God with confidence knowing that God will hear our prayers. The first step in overcoming adversity is prayer. The next lesson that Hezekiah teaches us about prayer is that when we pray to God with sincerity, God will answer our prayers. Remember here that after Hezekiah prayed and even wept bitterly to God, God moved by deciding to heal Hezekiah's body and even extending the king's life again by 15 years. This is what I call this morning. Can I say it how I see it? This is what I call a breakthrough. You do know and understand that the God we serve is still in the blessing business. And as I said last week, there are no shortages in the blessing department in heaven. Here, what we must remember is that before Isaiah had the opportunity to leave the grounds of the royal palace, God had begun to move and God had the prophet to turn around and deliver a second message to the king that God was going to heal him and extend his life. And sisters and brothers, this is what you and I must remember when we are facing difficult times and challenges in our own lives. If you and I hear me today, if we can humble ourselves to the point where we don't care who's looking at us or what someone might be saying about us, notice that Hezekiah is the king of Judah. However, he did not think himself too powerful and too sophisticated to turn his face to the wall, the text says, which is a gesture of reverence and pray to God. Tears had even begun to stream down Hezekiah's face. The text says that Hezekiah wept bitterly. Everybody could see it. In order to get a breakthrough, Hezekiah did not mind humbling himself before God and God responded to his request. And friends, the same thing must be said about us this morning when we face our own challenges and opposition. Can I talk plain here for a moment? The challenges that we face in this life are numerous and they can be overwhelming. I was recently telling a friend just last week that 2020 is a year that I would like to forget. This year has been fraught with unexpected chaos and difficulties. It seems as soon as we get out of one mess, here comes another mess. This reminds me of the time in my life I was so naive when I was in my early 20s. 
I thought that when I got into my 40s, that I would then be on easy street, that I would have life all figured out by that time. But how many of us know that nothing can be farther from the truth? In other words, the truth of the matter is that life can be difficult and life is challenging. The challenge, can I name them this morning? The challenges of unexpected sickness. Mm -hmm. The challenge of a difficult boss or manager on your job. The challenge of chronic unemployment. The challenge of financial lack and difficulty. The challenges of parenting in COVID-19. The challenge of a broken or severed relationship in your life. Whatever you and I will face or must face, we must never, however, give up. We must humble ourselves and pray to God with sincere hearts. And just like Hezekiah, I'm a witness that when you go to God in prayer, God God may not always show up when you want him, but I'm a witness that when he does show up and he will show up, God is always on time. When you pray to God in earnest, God will answer your prayer. The last point that I must make is simply this. There is no limit to the power of God through prayer. Oh, hallelujah, that's good news. There is no limit to the power of God through prayer. In the text, God responded to Hezekiah's concerns by healing him from his illness. Notice at the beginning of the text that the king was already sick and that the death sentence had already been pronounced on the king by the prophet. However, once again, after the king went to God in prayer, God gave the king a new lease on life. But not only healing Hezekiah, but God even went a step further by extending the king's life. Oh, God can do it this morning. And this is what you and I must remember today, sisters and brothers and friends, there is no limit to the power of God through prayer. And the reason that we can say this so confidently is because there is no limit to God's power. Just think about it for a moment this morning. We must understand that our God is omnipotent, meaning that God is all powerful and God possesses perfect and unlimited power to do anything he desires. But God is not only omnipotent, he is also omniscient meaning that God knows everything. God knows when a serious illness or crisis confronts us. And since God's power is limitless, this lets us know that God has the power to help us overcome our challenges. You and I must learn to depend on God. And here's the good news. There is no limit to the power that God can place and bless you in your life. There's no limit to the power of God through prayer. As I close, I hope that you'll always remember that when you face trouble and difficulty in life, then sincere prayer is the most effective way to change your situation for the better. As I close this message, I'm reminded of a story by Ed Hill, who pastored the Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church in Los Angeles, California. Reverend Hill tells the story of how mama's love and prayers changed his life. During the height of the depression, Hill's real mother, who had five children of her own, didn't have enough food to go around. So she sent four-year-old Ed to live with a friend in a small country town called Sweet Home. Ed just called her mama. As he was growing up in Sweet Home, Mama displayed remarkable faith, which led her to have big plans 
for young Ed against nearly insurmountable obstacles. Mama helped Ed graduate from high school, the only student to graduate that year from the country school, and even insisted that he go on to college. She took Ed one day to the bus station, handed him the ticket and $5 and said, now go off to Prairie View College and mama is going to be praying for you. Hill claims that he didn't know that much about prayer, but he knew mama did. When he arrived at college with a dollar and 90 cents in his pocket, they told him he needed $80 in cash in order to register. Here's how Hill describes what happened next. I got in line and the devil said, get out of line. But I heard my mama saying in my ear, I'll be praying for you. I stood in line on mama's prayer. Soon there was another new student ahead of me and I began to get nervous, but I stayed in line. Just about the time the other student got all of her stuff and turned away. A man by the name of Dr. Drew touched me on the shoulder and he said, are you Ed Hill? I said, yes. Are you Ed Hill from Sweet Home? Yes, I said. Have you paid yet? Not quite. We've been looking for you all morning, the doctor said. I said, well, what do you want with me? We have a four-year scholarship that will pay your room and board, your tuition, and give you $30 a month to spend. After learning this, all the future pastor could remember was hearing his mama's voice in his mind saying the words once again, I will be praying for you. And this, brothers and sisters, is my cry to all of us this morning. You and I must understand that we are also benefactors when we go to God in prayer. Your prayers to God, I'm here to let somebody know that they do make a difference. If you can only tell God in the midst of this pandemic that you've had enough, then that's what you've got to do until you can make it further and do better. Right now with so much on the line, we all must learn how to talk to God. It does not matter how big your storm is that you may be facing or will face someday. Again, you can be facing the loss of a job, the loss of a loved one, the challenge of raising a child all by yourself, the loss of a spouse through a divorce, the storm of enduring a difficult illness where the doctors have given up on you the storm of being disliked and misunderstood, or the storm of working for a paycheck that's already spent before you ever receive it. Whatever challenge you are facing, I stop by to tell you that there is hope for you and I today. And the good news is that you can pray and then be patient and that God will bring an end to your storm. Your prayer does not have to be long or elaborate, but if you and I can just learn how to cry out like Hezekiah, then that's enough to get God's attention and for God to begin moving in your favor by moving obstacles out of your way. And I'm a witness today because it wasn't that long ago when I was facing my own storm and I had to learn how to pray. I learned how to look to the hills from which claim my help. My help comes from the Lord. Not that long ago, I had to learn how to get down on my knees and cry, Lord, have mercy on me. Am I? Do I have a witness today that God can hear your cry and he will answer your prayer? And I'm a witness that if God can do it for me, then God can do it for anybody. In fact, he's already supplied our greatest need because when you and I, when you and I were lost in our sins, God sent his son named Jesus to die on an old rugged cross. I'm here to tell somebody, keep trusting and believing and don't Forget to pray. God is still able.
to bring you through your challenges, your obstacles, and any adversity that you will face. We have to talk to God. The man in the White House, mm -mm. he can't do it, won't do it. We're not even qualified to do it. But I'll tell you who's qualified to bring you through, to bring you over and through your obstacles and your adversity. That person is God Almighty. And when we get down on our knees, sincerely pray to God, tell God what's on our minds and on our hearts, and ask for God's help. I'm a witness that God, sometimes it seems a long time in coming, but don't you give up. God hears you. God is still with you. And God will bring you through the storm. Believe it. Believe in God through Jesus Christ. Trust in him. Keep the faith. God will bless you. Tell him what it is that you need. And sooner or later, in God's own time, God will bless you in the way that God sees fit. There's power in prayer. Will you pray this week? Will you pray today and pray this week? Will you continue and in other cases start a dedicated prayer life? Like Hezekiah, know God for yourself. And the only way to know God is to study his word, is to have a di and to have a dialogue with God on a daily basis. Amen, amen, and amen, and may God bless you. Brothers and sisters, may we bow our heads, and if there is one today that does not know Jesus, but you want to get into a relationship, a relationship with Christ that will change your life, and you want to put Christ at the head and center of your life, you can do that right now by simply saying, Christ, I confess my sins to you. Christ, I want you to come into my life and into my heart, and I want you to lead me and accept me. Come into my heart, Christ, because there's nobody else on this planet on, in heaven or on this earth who can bless me like you can and who can save me. So Christ, I put you first today. Christ, I open my heart to you today. And Christ, I will follow you now for the rest of my life. Can you do that right now? Accept him. And I promise you, Christ will come in. All you have to do is say, yes, Christ, I accept you. May we bow our heads for a word of prayer. Merciful God, Father, we come again at this hour to say thank you. We thank you, God, because we are believing that there are those who are listening to this message who did not have a relationship with you. But now, God, they're saying, yes, I accept you into my life and into my heart. Yes, Christ, I now put you at the head of my life. We ask, God, that you would bless them right now. Thank you, God, for the step, this step of faith that they are taking today. Those of us who already know you, we ask, God, that you would strengthen our relationships we pray, God, that you would give us an understanding that there is power in prayer. Father, we pray for all the sick. We pray, God, for all bereaved families. We pray, God, for the Wilkins family. We ask, God, that you would continue to comfort them, build them up, God, strengthen them. 
God, we pray for an end to this terrible, terrible pandemic. We pray, God, that you will bring healing to this land, healing to this country, healing to this world. We need you right now, God. Father, bless us. Bless those that are lying in hospital beds. Bless those that are in homes today that are sick. From whatever disease, God, we know you have the power to heal. So heal them right now, God. Continue to walk with us, guide us, direct us. God, we pray for your protection. Protect our bodies. Please keep sickness at bay. And Father, in advance of every blessing, we say thank you and we honor you and we praise you because you are worthy. It is in the precious name of your son, Jesus the Christ, that we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Brothers and sisters, friends, God bless you. May God keep you and may heaven smile upon you. Thank you for tuning in to this week's edition of YouTube TV, Majority Baptist Church TV on YouTube. Don't forget to vote. Vote like your life depends on it. Also, don't forget to wear a mask. Very, very important. Again, may God bless you. And until next time, Take care, and I hope to see you back here on next Sunday. Amen. Bless you. Bye-bye.